Bonjour, bonsoir, dear friends. It is so exciting Bonjour. to be together again on JCB Live and to introduce you one of the most amazing men in the history of wine, who is a legacy to the history, to the present, and obviously the future as well. The man is named Stephen Spurrier. Bonjour, Stephen. Bonjour, Jean-Charles. Très heureux. Well, it's such a pleasure to be together, even though we love to be each other physically much more than at a distance. But yeah. so where are you today? I'm in, I'm in Dorset. I'm in Bridewell. I'm in Littenchini in the stables block in the wine and art room of Bride Valley, our tasting room, where I've got over three dozen paintings and artifacts I've collected over the years. Just like you, I'm mad about art. I don't create it. You create it. I just collect it. Well, you collect um, a lot of amazing pieces. It's a lovely sunny day and the vines are looking good. So it's a pleasure to be here and talk to you. Well, this is a great honor. So you've been over the last six weeks in, uh, in Dorset then, huh? Yeah, that's right. So, you know, Stephen, we need to start by the beginning. You have yeah. an incredible uh, and phenomenal fruitful history and you've done so much for the wine world, but there's one thing that specifically here where I sit in the heart of Napa Valley, we should talk about that sparked an unbelievable revolution that made America very famous. You were already very famous, but it made America very famous. The wonderful of what you've called the judgment of Paris. So what sparked that moment and that creation and that passion for wine? Well, the, the, the judgment of Paris, as it became known, thanks to George Tabor, who is the journalist from Time magazine who was there, and had he not been there, uh, and had my wife not been there to take the photographs, no one, one would have ever heard of it, was because at L'Académie du Vin, my wine school in Paris, we were the only game in town for people who spoke English and loved wine. And um, in the 74, 75, a lot of California vintners and Alex Bespaloff and Robert Finnegan used to bring bottles of California wine, which I had never tasted before. And so Chardonnay, Cabernet Sauvignon. And my partner at La Canary de Vin, Patricia Gallagher, was American and her family had come over one of the early settlers and she was very proud of America. And so she said, why don't we do a tasting to get the opinion formers in France to recognize the quality of these wines. Unbelievable. So I said, Patricia, okay, that's fine. Good idea. We, we were giving lots of tastings. So um, she went to have some vacation time in California. And, and Robert, Stephen, forgive me to interrupt. So you were doing those tasting in Paris at your own Académie du Vin. Oh yeah, we used to give, we were really the only game in town giving, giving tastings. I mean, no one did. The French, I wouldn't say the French, the Parisians weren't interested in wine, they were wine drinkers, but they weren't interested in learning about wine. My Academy de Vin was the first private wine school in the whole of France. That's amazing. So anyway, we were, we were, and very, we were also very, very highly respected. So um, Patricia went to California, Robert Finningham fixed her up with a lot of visits to Stag's Leap and Montalena and places like that. She made a prime selection, she came back raving about the quality. We set up the idea, we got the tasters, and uh, Bella and I, my wife and I went um, around April, Easter time, 76, and I made a final selection. I got Ridge and I got Heights and uh, I got Chalon, and we had six Chardonnays and six Cabernets. <laughs> and they were brought over by Joanne Dickinson, as she was then, and a wine and tennis group with um, with uh, Louis Martini, a whole bunch of people, and Andre Chelichev. And if they hadn't brought the wines with them, 24 bottles, the tasting wouldn't have happened. So the wines <laughs> arrived, and what's important, the key is, about a week before, I thought the tasters we've got are the nine best palates in France. But with one exception, Ober de Valen of the Romani Conti, who was married to a girl from San Francisco, they would never have tasted California wines before. And I was afraid. Hard to imagine. I was afraid they damn them with praise. 
you know, your wonderful French expression, c'est pas mal. C'est pas mal. Okay. So that was my worry. So I thought the only way I can really get recognition, but it's a risk, is to have them tasted blind against the best white, white wines from Burgundy, Chardonnay from Burgundy, and Cabernet Sauvignon dominated wines from Bordeaux. So I put in uh, Aubryon, Mouton, and uh, Batamont Rachet, and Mercer Premier Cru, and the tasters agreed to they taste them like blind. Them. They said, but a problem, so it's amusing. <laughs> and the rest is history. And I would have been happy with just out of 10 wines if we got two wines, well, if we got a second and a fifth, as it was, we got a first and a fifth. And so it really was, it was, as you said, it's a benchmark. It's a groundbreaking tasting. And as George Taylor's book said, it changed the world of wine. Yes. And were, were there similar vintages or was it different Pretty vintages? Pretty much similar, or? yeah, within, within a vintage or two. I mean, the oldest of the reds was 70 and the youngest was 73. And the whites were, one was 69 in Fremark Abbey and the others were 72 and 73. So and they were actually, Yeah, within mm -hmm. the Académie du Vin after this, did it trigger a lot of interest for California wines as well? Well, I mean, then from that moment, I began to import California wines in, in a small way. But the, the most important thing, well, it put California wine on the map. The restaurants um, on the East Coast in New York, they weren't buying California wines. And suddenly they were. Um, but the most important thing it did, which I think Jean-Charles, you'll appreciate, is it created a template whereby unknown wines of quality could be tasted blind against known wines of quality. And if the judges were themselves of quality, the opinion of the judges would be respected. That's right. And that completely changed the world of wine because it leveled the playing field. What a great way to introduce a new continent <laughs> to such a culture of wine. Well, yeah. this is so exciting. So today, I wanted to have a toast to you with this very elegant wine. You know, within the range of the JCB wines, which yeah. are first American wines, we make a wine that is very spicy, luscious, yeah. and yeah. quite elegant in honor of 76. So I'm going to have a toast for you, with you. And I think we need I'll to have a toast you, together. I'll toast, my, I'll toast you with my blonde de blanc. So I'm getting <laughs> closer to the camera. So here we are. Chin chin. Chin chin. Cheers. So before we move, yeah. Stephen, into the wonderful creation that you've uh, uh, with so much success have released. Why no sparkling wine in well, the judgment of Paris? I mean, I think, I think no sparkling wine because it was just Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon. If there were to be a sparkling wine judgment now, um, I think it would be, have to be in categories. You would have to have the Brut Reserve. You would have to have the Blanc de Blanc. You'd have to have the Rosés. And it also should be, um, you were referring to vintages, it should either be vintages near to each other or it should be in price brackets. And I simply do not approve of comparing a, a $50 English sparkling wine to a $150 champagne. That doesn't make sense. It, because now it's not a competition, it's a sort of observation just to see who's doing what. But I must, what put English wines, English sparkling wine on the map was in the mid 90s, I was invited to the awards reception for the International Wine and Spirit competition, handed a glass of sparkling wine like yep. this, asked what it was. And I said, well, it's um, champagne, of course, certainly a Blanc de Blanc, maybe a Grand Cru, why? Night Timber. And Night Timber from Sussex had beaten yep. all the top champagne. And then Ridgeview in 2006 at the Decanter World Wine Awards beat all the top champagnes. And then you will remember well, Jean-Charles, I put a dossier together, which I brought to Vin Expo 2007. For sure. And Wasse got interested in English sparkling wine. And it's thanks 
you sent Georges Legrand, your sparkling wine man, down three yes. times. And we didn't have enough, anyway, we, we didn't do it together because you were looking for a lot more volume than, well, we, we could only plant 10 or 12 hectares. But well, and, it, and, and Stephen, what was important, so all our friends listening should know that uh, Stephen owns an amazing estate which needs to remain in his family for the many generations to come. So Stephen, <laughs> you should explain the context because Stephen, as famous of a writer, journalist, historian of wine, one of the catalysts of international wine, and one of the most amazing men to actually taste and review Burgundies as well, where I happen to be from, yes. created his own fantastic estate in one of his estate in the you know, Bright Valley region. So Stephen, we should, as I'm opening your fabulous Cremant, yes. you should tell us what triggered your interest to start your own because you've been writing about wine, tasting other people's wine, but now this is yours. Well, it's, it's oh my God. That. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. No, this is, ex you might, you I must did that on purpose. So we have an escalation of bubbles. <laughs> I shaked it a little bit. Um, <laughs> well, when my wife bought the farm in, um, in 1987, so there was a lot of chalk on it. And um, I was still working in Paris at the time at the Cadre de Vin. So I put a couple of blocks of chalk in my pocket and I took them back to uh, Paris and put them on the desk in front of Michel Bertin, who was my top professor. And um, I said, Michel, where do you think those are from? He said, what, well, Champagne, of course. And I said, no, they're from South Dorset. He said, in that case, you should plant a vineyard. Well, I didn't but it's stuck in my mind. And our farm's in a big bow and, and, and it, we overlook the sea, but down in the bottom of bow, the slopes are southeast, southwest, south. And uh, every time I looked at them, I thought, well, there has to be a vineyard there someday. And so thanks to the success of First Night Timber and then Ridgeview, and also the farm was a sheep farm and the sheep were losing money and I got fed up with financing the sheep. <laughs> so I told Bella that I'll turn a loss-making sheep farm into a profit-making vineyard. <laughs> well, Why not? This is brilliant. You know what happens. As, as Philippine de Rothschild said, making wine's easy. It's the first 200 years that are difficult. Um, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so it, well, it, you started with great success. I mean, you know, tell us a little bit about the development of the land because we were delighted, obviously, to help a little bit. But tell us about you getting the plants, the materials, and really well, I mean, George, the image George of what you George wanted. Legrand, George de Grand came out. We did a lot of soil samples. He sent all the soil samples to his own laboratory and also to Pepinier Guillaume, who supply you with your vines, and they're the best pepinierists in, in France. And... Um, and so eventually, uh, having established there were 10 or so hectares we could plant, um, and Georges had visited Folio Estate just next door, who makes the wine for us, and he was the UK winemaker of the year 2012. Yeah. Um, the Boisset instructions were very simple. You and your wife plant the 10 hectares. Yeah. You buy the vines from Pepinier Guillaume. You take the grapes to Ian Edwards at Folio Estate. And if all goes well, we'll buy your wine. So that's what you've got in front of you. I'm sorry it exploded, but anyway. No, I shaked it every night. We yeah. have to have an effect of surprise. <laughs> and this is really quite amazing. Stephen, yeah. tell us a little bit about the, this is the Cremont. Well, the Cremont, it's the first, it's the only English Cremont. Yeah. And it really was a question of necessity being the mother of invention. Mm. And the 15 vintage was so cold that we picked at barely seven and a half degrees alcohol and at 12.5 acid. And basically we couldn't, we couldn't make a sparkling wine out of that. Not, not a vintage wine. So we waited until 16 came along and we made a blend and 16 was just 8.5 acidity. And even so, 
the juice to me was too green, too aggressive. And I asked Ian Edwards, I said, can you make a cremant, which is one third less sparkling than fully sparkling champagne? He That's said, fine. of course I can. So he makes the cremant and so time passes. This had gone into bottle in, in, in June 17. In uh, September 18, we taste it and um, it worked. And I gave it a dosage of nine, nine degree dosage. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. We are below 10 grams. Yeah. yeah. And this then I, I applied to call it a cremant, and the European Union told me I couldn't because it was a French word. And so I said, but so is brute. And they replied that, yes, but the English use brute for aftershave as well. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, but they didn't allow me to use cremant. But then I was told if, I, if it came from a specific region, I might get an Appalachian, which is called a PDO, a, a protected denomination of origin, just like your Appalachians. That's so a bit cool to be able to get Dorset Cremant, and it's got its own PDO. So there it is. So, I mean, I, might, I don't say I've always created new things, not as often as you, but I have created the first English Cremant with its own PDO. And I must confess, this is outstanding for us. Yeah, yeah. We've been focusing on Cremant from Burgundy or Loire or the Jura and many other regions. This is absolutely spectacular. So, Stephen, you're the king of description, okay. of course. So, how would you describe this unbelievable creation of yours uh, as the first ever Bright Valley English Cremant? Well, I think it, it has a, a kind of apple, a Granny Smith flavor. The, the, the one thing which Bride Valley wines have, we're a cool climate. And I was up in Champagne you know, it, with, a lot of, with a lot of producers. And one of them produced Grand Cru, Grand Cru Chouilly, Blanc de Blanc. Yep. And everyone had brought their own wines. And I brought my Blanc de Blanc and I asked him to taste it. And he, he approved of it. And he said, Mr. Spurrier, you've got what we've lost, acidity. And global warming is losing champagne its acidity, whereas we have natural acidity. And so that is probably my one word for Bride Valley wines is precision. Yes. They have precision of fruit that I find remarkable. And um, the Blanc de Blanc I got in my glass now, 17, is so precise that I wouldn't say it's faultless, but it's just so beautifully precise. Yeah, I would echo that and I would say, you know, in a blind tasting, you would be, you know, on the tet of all the cuvées you could possibly imagine as one of the best of the best. And yeah. this is really, for many people sometimes, specifically here in the US, quite hard to imagine to see English sparkling at such a level, the moment people taste it. And as you know, people in America are very open-minded, so they're willing to, yeah. to try the wines. They are, I must say, absolutely amazed. So mm. this is really, really exciting. So Stephen, maybe you want to tell us as well about the range, because as you could see, we will offer to a lot of our friends the opportunity to get a few of those bottles in the next few days. And we wanted to present three of them. So we have the Cremant, then you have the spectacular Brut Rosé maybe. You can briefly describe this one as well, the Brut Rosé. And then yeah. we'll go into the Brut Reserve. Okay. Well, the, the Rosé uh, called Rosé Bella, um, yeah, I've got, I've got one here. Uh, and um, Bella for your beautiful, irresistible wife, of course. Yeah, exactly. So um, this is made in what's called the Chenier process. Yeah. And there are two ways of making a rosé sparkling wine. One is to have a white sparkling wine and then to add red wine at the, at the dosage stage. And that's easy. The difficult one is to take the Pinot Noir grapes to the winery and to macerate them for 48 hours, press them very slowly, and the color of the juice that runs off will be darker than you need. And then you blend it. When it comes to blending, you blend it with maybe, we blend it with 50% Chardonnay. So this is a, 
rosé, Pinot Noir rosé, Pinot Noir, Seigneur yeah. process, 50 Pinot Noir, 50% Chardonnay. And what um, it has, uh, it has a wonderful wild strawberry flavor. And that's mm -hmm. what Pinot Noir has. And when you taste it, you can taste the red fruits. And it's possibly a little bit fuller in color than the current fashion for rosés, which is the palest, palest, palest possible rosé, like the Provence rosés. I don't go that way, because my view is the more you strip the color, you strip the fruit. Absolutely. Yeah, and I want people, when they taste my rosé, to taste the fruit. So that's the rosé. The Brut Reserve, you've got the 14 there. We didn't make it in 15 nor in 16 is a blend of, I was trying to copy Paul Rocher. Yeah, I was trying to copy Paul Rocher and doing one third Pinot Noir, one third Pinot Meunier, one third Chardonnay, but it's probably 60% Pinots and 40% Chardonnay. In 2018, when we had almost a Mediterranean summer, the Brut Reserve is 65% Pinot Noir and 35% Chardonnay. So that's the way we're going to keep it. We're going to reserve the Pinot Meunier for the Cremel. I love this idea very, very much. Yeah. So this is an incredible range of wine. You've, you've produced such a diversity into such a period of time. Yeah. So it's so exciting, Stephen. Do you think you have fulfilled one of the main passion is to become a sparkling wine vintner? Well, I'm not the vintner. I only, um, Bella is the farmer. Um, I only intervene at the blending time, at the tasting time before blending, putting in a bottle, and then to judge the dosage. I'm the brand ambassador, um, but it carries, well, it carries our name, Bright Valley. It's, 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 it's our wine, and um, I must say I'm very proud of it. I mean, I've, I'm, I'm excessively proud of it, and the more the vines age, I'm just tasting <clears throat> the 2019s, blending the 2019s, and um, it was a rainy vintage, but the extra year, the vines are still not 10 years old, but the older, every year, the vineyard ages, there's more character and more precision of fruit, and well, you would know that, of course. But I, I'm, I'm, uh, I regret, well, the investment weighs heavily on my shoulders, put it that way, but I don't regret it, and the vineyard is very beautiful. Well, the result is exceptional. And, you know, yeah. with wine, we cannot replace time. We need to, yeah. sadly, sometimes, as impatient as we could be as individual, give time, time. Because thanks to yeah. time, you know, a sparkling wine improves. When do you think the estate will be at its prime and you feel, you know, the vines are really having more history in the terroir? I would think um, the vineyard is looking very good now. We've had a very sunny April. It's wonderfully sunny outside, but quite cool. Um, I'm thinking this year <clears throat> with the vineyard um, coming into its 10th year, I think we'll see, well, if the, if the harvest, if the summer goes on as we hope, I think we'll see uh, a step Oh, 2018 was fantastic, but I think we'll see a confirmation. And as you know, once you have the confirmation, then you're on the right track. For sure. Um, I mean, well, I you're already on the right track, Stephen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think mean, there's, I, a lot of, there's a lot of confirmation already in the wines. Yeah. And, and, um, and you add that supreme spirituality that soul to the estate you've been there for the last six weeks you must add a lot of you know passion and energy to it that makes the wine as well a lot better as we know well i mean i i just think i'm very lucky that that, that the wines turned out to be the sort of wines i i wanted them to be <laughs> you know i mean i there's a lot of chalk i mean we're 90 percent chalk and that and the cool climate um, elegance, precision and elegance are really the hallmarks. And, um, and I think Englishness. <laughs> yes, which we love. <laughs> which we love. And, and, you know, for everybody with us yeah. today, which is extremely difficult to achieve in Champagne, 
or sparkling wine is what yeah. Stephen is referring to, precision. And yeah. this is what he's achieved at the highest level with this absolutely incredible range of wine. So I'm so excited to, for all of us to be able to share those great wines, Stephen. And I want to comment as well on your back label, which I love. If people want to imagine the fabulous estate you live on, this is this brilliant idea to do the picture on the back hang on, hang on, hang on one second. I got to brush up. We got to see this amazing estate. And, and as many of us love to go to England, this region of the Dorset is absolutely yeah. magnificent. I don't know so, whether, whether that. Yeah, that's beautiful. A little higher, maybe, Stephen. I yeah. don't know whether that shows any. Perfect. Yes. And tell us maybe a last question about your fabulous family crest that you've done that I find absolutely brilliant. You know, I love design and I love yeah. creating design. So maybe you want to comment on this one. Well, Stimulus Ade is the, well, the name is Sparia, but Stimulus Ade means Sparon from the Latin. And, um, and you see, we've got a couple of spurs on top, and we've got a um, we've got a cross. Um, uh, I mean, we've we've been we've been on we've been on the same land up in Derbyshire for over five hundred years. Yes. And my older brother, who very sadly passed away last year, um, you know, the, the, it, it's it's quite an old family, and so I'm I don't mind being elitist i'm sure you don't either and so if you have a family if you have a family crest which is actually real and not invented i think it's worth using but it's used very discreetly we need to have not only a toast to the spurier legacy but the <laughs> continuity stephen and which is so important is the next 500 years because which is really wonderful in your case as well is you working very closely with your family, your children. So it's a place yeah. where you gather. It's, it's a family destination. Well, I remember last year, last June, we had the Boisse crew, yeah. all your lovely salespeople come out, and they were going to come out again this June, but of course not now. But we'll welcome you back next year. Thank you. And to all our listeners, if anyone is ever in the fabulous... Uh, United Kingdom, this is going to be the time to eventually escape to the wine country of England. Now, Stephen, the last question we need to ask you, you know, many people know you through your fabulous involvement in so many great magazines, including Decanter that you helped so much become what it is to all the books you've written, to all the great speech you've done and everything else. Is there a secret you would like to share with everyone that you've never well there's a secret shared. which i'd like to share with you and that is if on the 23rd of may not the 24th i suggested to jim barrett of montelena and warren wernioski of stag's leap that if their wines did well they might give me 50 cents a bottle <laughs> i'm sure they would me. <laughs> you fully deserve it for what you've done for california and France at the same time, and the world of wine. So, well, dear friends, to Stephen Spurrier, the famous Stephen, thank you. And to John so much. Thank you very much, John Shaw. To you and for being with us and for creating such spectacular wines and great vision for the generation to come in England and a great example to follow. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Jean-Charles. Bonne journée. <laughs> Merci.